We don't believe politicians' promises to us, do we? But we vote for them anyway. It may surprise you to learn that research over the last 50 years has found that on average, U.S. presidents have kept 67% of their promises. Uh, they've, they've done a lot of different studies over 50 years, and that's what they found. And you know what? Meatloaf said two out of three ain't bad, right? <laughs> so presidential promises, well, presidential promise keeping has gone as high as 80%. It's never gone below 50% since 1912. Of course, we're still not satisfied. We usually give our presidents just 100 days to get things done. For some reason, 100 days is always a key marker for a new administration, right? It's always like, what did they do in their first 100 days? And at the first 100-day mark, there's always a flurry of news reporting and articles uh, about whether they've made good on their campaign speeches or not. Did they do what they promised they would do after we so generously gave them an entire 14 weeks to get it all done, to change everything in the country and everything in the economy and everything in world relations? You had 14 weeks to do it. But, I mean, I, I see you guys are on board with the 100-day thing. That's fine. <laughs> Just saying, what did you get done the first 100 days of your job? You know, I didn't get anything done. So, anyway, God made astounding promises to Abraham. We find ourselves not 100 days into this man's story, but more than 100 years. And so we would expect to see some progress made on those more descendants than the stars of the sky and owning all the land of Canaan promises that were made so long ago. Instead, what do we see? We see a pretty different picture, if we're honest. We see Sarah dead, having only delivered one baby. We see Abraham having to shell out just to have a piece of ground to bury his own wife in. Taking stock of all of this, we wonder, what about those promises? Well, Hebrews comments on this very thing in Hebrews chapter 11, and there we read this, all these believers like Abraham were approved of their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. Whoa, wait just a minute. What do you mean they didn't receive what was promised? I thought God kept his promises. Isn't that the whole point? Is this all just an empty hope? Is this all just some sort of scam uh, that God is running on us? When we face the hardest parts of life, the difficult terrain of the, the life that we live, what does it mean to hold on to our beliefs? Well, let's see what Abraham has to teach us about the Christian faith when it seems like God has forgotten his promises. Verse 20, now after these things, Abraham was told, Milcah also has borne sons to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, his brother Buzz, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, D Jidlap, and Bethuel. And Bethuel fathered Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Reuma, also bore Teba, Geham, Tehash, and Maacah. It's interesting to learn that Abraham kept in touch with his Mesopotamian family. God had called Abraham out, and they had left. They had separated from his family. Uh, but apparently they still had some sort of contact together. Now, we're told about his nephews and niece because this is where Isaac is going to get his wife in a couple of passages, and so it's important for Moses to kind of introduce her to us. And you probably noticed out of that whole list of names, just the one name that pops out, Rebecca. Like, okay, phew, I recognize that name. Who's, who's that? We'll, we'll meet her a little bit later. But let's consider for a moment the real-life emotion that perhaps Abraham and Sarah felt when they received this news. The extended family way back in the homeland had become quite large, 12 sons, probably many daughters, though Moses only mentions one. And, and what would happen next? Next, Abraham would have to write a letter of his own, right? I mean, that's what you do when, when someone reaches out to you and gives, gets an update, you send an update back. And what would he have to say? I mean, really, the great man of faith, the great friend of God, the father of nations who left his family so that he could go on this, you know, wild goose chase into a new land with this God no one had ever heard of in his family. Well, what would he say? He's like, well, I have one kid, 
Well, actually, I have two, but we don't talk about Bruno, is what he would have said. And so, these are real people, and this is a real situation. You have a family. You're on that family group thread that you're like, you know, you're looking at it, and you're like, what am I going to say to this? There's a scene in Nora Ephron's beloved movie, Julie and Julia, if you're familiar with it, where Julia Child receives word that her newlywed sister is pregnant. Now, Julia Child and and her husband in the movie are depicted as always wanting children but unable to have them. And so in that moment, she receives the letter and, and, and she's overcome because she just breaks down with heartache. Uh, and she's, in, she's heartbroken, and she's just with tears says to her husband, hey, my sister's pregnant. I, I'm so happy. But she's heartbroken at the same time. Uh, it was a hard piece of news to receive. There was this ache and, and this sort of disappointment that kind of lingered around. And we don't know how Abraham and Sarah felt about all of these things, but they are real people. And they were real people who were hearing from God and who God had made these very specific promises to. And on the human level, if they look around, they're like, I I thought I was going to be the father of nations. You you talked about sand on the seashore. You talked about stars in the sky. You talked about all the land that I have walked through being all mine and all belonging to my, my descendants. And we know, at least on some level, these thoughts, these questions kind of uh, had a, a, a spot in Abraham's heart, not in a bad way, just in a realistic way. Because remember, he had talked to God that one time, and he says, hey, what are we going to do? Some servant in my household who I'm not even related to, he's going to inherit everything. And the Lord said, hey, don't worry, we're going to take care of that. And there's another time where he had said to God, hey, how do I know? What's the sign that I'm going to receive the land? And so we know that there were these real life, real person thoughts in Abraham's heart and in Sarah's as well. She came to Abraham and she said, God has restrained me from having children. And so why don't we do this Hagar thing and and this big, big problem, right? So these are real people. And now they're getting word from the family that they had to separate out from because, hey, get away from that old family, get away from that old land, get away from that old system. And then they get the update that everything is going so good. There's more kids than we can count. We have all of this different stuff going on. Uh, I I think it would have been a hard day. Now, there's something else for us here. Sharp-eyed Bible commentators have noticed that we see 12 sons born to this other family, this other family sort of in proximity to the family of God. And even sharper commentators notice that they're in this list that we're given, eight are born from the wife, four from the concubine. Now, this very same arrangement will happen with Jacob, 12 tribes, who come from 12 sons, eight of those sons born from the wives, four from the concubines. Of course, we already know that Ishmael, who went out from the family of faith, were all, was also going to produce 12 sons and 12 tribes from them. Is this just a coincidence? No, it, 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 it is a demonstration to us, a devotional insight, that there is always a counterfeit alternative to the work of God. There's always a, a, a counterfeit, uh, you know, set of currency, in a sense, out there, parading as the work of God. And, and it's going to culminate, it's going to find its ultimate expression in the Antichrist, right? It is, he is the counterfeit Christ who's going to seem like he died and was resurrected, who has this false prophet, who has all of these abilities and these sorts of things. It's going to culminate in the Antichrist, but all along the way, as, as God is doing his work, we see our enemy, the devil, doing a counterfeit work that is, is meant to sort of mirror an alternative uh, what God is doing. And one, one close-up of this is where we see Moses who finally goes to Egypt, and he performs his signs for Pharaoh. But what happens? Janus and Jambres, Pharaoh's magicians say, yeah, we can do that too. And they do their false signs. They do their anti-signs. And Pharaoh says, okay, I don't need to believe in this guy Moses and whatever God he's talking about. And so uh, this is something that happens along the way. And so as we're living life, as God is working, 
there is this sort of mirror option where it looks like the real thing, but in reality, it is a God-rejecting, man-centered alternative. This is where the religions of the world come from. Many of them that look an awful lot like Christianity, look an awful lot like um, you know, things that you hear about in the Scripture, but are not like it at all. They are counterfeit. Now, John the Apostle in his letter, 1 John, he tells us to watch out for these counterfeits. He calls them antichrist. He says, yeah, there is an antichrist coming, but there's already many antichrists in the world right now. Watch out for them, he says, because they even work to infiltrate the church at large. And so just be careful and make sure that, that the thing that you're going after, the thing you're affiliating with, the thing that you're tying your life to, the thing that you're building up your family on and all these things is actually the rock, Jesus Christ, and not some false counterfeit. One more thing. We find here another subtle reminder about God's wonderful plan for marriage. God doesn't call everyone to be married, most but not all. Uh, it's not more spiritual to be single. It's not more spiritual to be married. What's spiritual is to do what God asks you to do. Uh, and so you need to figure that out between you and the Lord. If you are not married, you need to figure out if you're supposed to be married. If you are married, you're married, and God tells you to stay married. Um, but for those who are being led to marriage, right, you single people here tonight, Genesis, again, presents to us the idea that God has a specific person prepared and in mind for you. Eve was made for Adam. He didn't just go to the shelf and pull down, let's just, I've got a, uh, who was it? Who got in trouble? Um, binders full of women. Remember that? Who's that? Romney, right? Romney got, got in trouble. I don't even remember, but he, in some campaign speech, he, he referenced that, who are you going to appoint to cabinets? And he made the very bad decision to say, oh, we've got a lot of candidates. We've got binders full of women. And you think, whoa, <laughs> but that's not good. Uh, you do? And so, but, so, so God didn't just have binders full of women and I just pick one and give them to Adam. He said, no, he, he prepared Eve specially out of his side, crafted her so that they could be together in a very special relationship. And so God has a specific person in mind for you single people if he's calling you into marriage. Rebecca was the one that the Lord had in mind for Isaac. We'll see the incredible uh, careful providence that God works together to accomplish that. And so if you're single here tonight, particularly if you're young and you've not been married, if you're single, you need to figure out if the Lord is leading you into marriage. And if so, it is so important that you choose to let the Lord lead you to the person He has in mind for you, the person He has had in mind for you from before the foundation of the earth. And He will lead you. Now, hearing that, Perhaps uh, some married person in here thinks, well, I'm already married, and I honestly didn't seek the Lord, so what does that mean for me? We're going to touch on this a little bit in a moment, but if you're thinking, well, so is, this, so is this guy saying that I'm supposed to get divorced and find the right person? No, that isn't what the Lord says to do. That's not biblical. It is the opposite of what God says. In fact, specifically, God says to us in 1 Corinthians 7, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband. A husband is not to divorce his wife. And this is not a marriage study. There are biblical grounds for divorce. You can study into that. Um, it's pretty straightforward in the Bible. But if you're married, you're to remain married unless you have biblical grounds for divorce. And even then, you need to seek the Lord about what He wants for you and your life. So if you're being called into marriage, there is some Rebecca for you fellows. There is some Isaac for you ladies. The Lord knows, and you probably do not know yet, but the Lord knows, and He will lead you to them if you will follow Him, if you will trust Him, and if you will give that decision over to Him. Verse 1 of chapter 23 says, Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were all the years of her life. Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. When Sarah died, Isaac is 37 years old. Abraham is 137 years old. Uh, Isaac is going to be married three years from this point. Abraham is going to live another 38 years before he dies. As Sarah passes on into eternity, we readers are very tenderly left outside the tent. We do not go in with him uh, while he goes in to mourn for her. It gives us a moment standing outside the tent to think about their life together, Abraham and Sarah. 
the many things they had been through, the long years together. As we read through these chapters, you know, admittedly, the focus is, is primarily on Abraham, but let's not forget that Sarah was beside him all along. She was also a faithful follower of God. She made her mistakes, to be sure, but she loved the Lord, and she walked with Him and grew in her faith, just like God intends for each of us. Now, when I mentioned Isaac and Rebecca, again, maybe you thought, well, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, maybe you got married before you were a believer, or you just didn't consult the Lord with that decision. That happens. And you know what? It happened to Abram and Sarai. They didn't know the Lord before they got married. Uh, they, they, they weren't seeking the Lord about that. Um, did God force them to get married? We don't believe that God controls your decisions in that way. We believe God is a providential God and that God works out His will, but we also believe the Bible presents human beings as being free moral agents who are able to make choices that God says, you probably shouldn't have made that choice. And so Abram and Sarai, back in Ur of the Chaldees, are not believers. Uh, and, and, and we have no indication that they were seeking God on whether they should get married, right? And so what do we see? We see that even still, God did a really wonderful, miraculous thing for this couple. Now, they had some real marriage problems along the way. Uh, twice, he sold his wife into a harem to different guys, you know? I mean, that's, those are bad marriage problems. <laughs> And, and you married people know that it, it, we read this in the Bible, and especially if you grew up reading the Bible or grew up in church, these stories become sort of sterilized to us because we hear them a lot. And, and the, it, in a lot of these cases, the Bible doesn't necessarily get into the nitty-gritty conversation that they had in the tent after all that happened. But do you think that Abraham and Sarah did not have a hard time after that happened. Hey, remember that time you sold me to a Philistine harem so that you could have an easier life? That didn't happen once, it happened twice. And then he could be like, hey, remember that time you forced your maidservant on me and then like it pretty much destroyed our family, not once, but twice? I mean, so these were, these were real difficulties that they would have had to work through, real marriage problems. But look at what God did even so. He turned Abram and Sarai into Abraham and Sarah, people full of love for each other and full of fruitfulness and grace and a long, uh, beautiful companionship together. These two people show us what kind of beauty God can bring from our ashes. And God is the God who brings beauty from ashes. And so does that mean, well, who, then who cares? I'll just go out and do whatever, and God will just clean up the mess. No, that's obviously not the point of Scripture either. But if you're thinking, well, I've made some mistakes in my marriage, I've made some mistakes in my life, the Lord loves you and still has great intentions for your marriage and can bring incredible, world-changing uh, beauty from the uh, ashes of our own mistakes. Abraham and Sarah show us how God can overcome our weaknesses, our mistakes, and how He can redeem our relationships. If you knew Abram and Sarai and, and you were looking at things that were going down in their marriage, you probably would, after you had you know, lunch with them, you would have been like, boy, they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. And instead, they became Abraham and Sarah, not because of what they did, but because of what God did in their hearts and how He brought them together. Now, the New Testament tells us that Abraham had some understanding of the resurrection. We don't know how, but he did. He said, I assume that God is going to have to raise Isaac from the dead. And we're told that he had some understanding of the future city whose builder and maker is God, heaven. So, Abraham believed that he and his family were going to live forever in heaven, and yet we see him mourn and weep when his wife departed. Grief is normal. It is a godly part of life. As Christians who believe in the resurrection, we don't say, don't, who cares that your loved one died? You're, you know, that doesn't matter because of the resurrection. The Bible says, uh, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus when he knew that 10 seconds from then he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And so grief and sorrow is a real thing. It is a godly thing. Uh, we don't need to pretend like we don't need to grieve. And yet, 
we do not grieve like those who have no hope. The passing of a loved one uh, can be immensely painful in a way like no other pain can cause pain. At the same time, the passing of a loved one should not completely derail our lives perpetually because we do know that death is not the end. We will see our saved loved ones again, and all will be made right forever and ever. And so the Bible doesn't shy away from the idea that we're going to mourn or that we're going to have grief. In fact, it promises that you are going to have grief. And so it says, comfort yourselves and comfort one another with the certain hope that we have. Uh, in the resurrection and the work that God is going to do, that in the end, the Lord will make all things right. But in the meantime, death does remain a painful reality, which begs the question, why do Christians have to die? I thought that the whole point is that death is defeated. The Bible says death is defeated by Jesus Christ on the cross. And so why do we have to die? If I'm in Christ and I was crucified with Christ, and death is defeated, then why do I still have to die? Shouldn't we be exempt? It's like those cars that are driving around California exempt, and they do whatever they want. They're sw swerving all over the, ra the, the lanes, and you're like, well, they're exempt. One practical answer to why you and I as Christians still have to die is that we still live in a fallen world in decaying bodies impacted by sin. That's just reality. Glorification is coming, but it is not yet. God leaves us here to endure mortality so that we can join with Him in His work in saving other people. But just as God transforms our lives when we are born again, He also transforms our deaths. Death no longer has any sting for the believer. That doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant. But the Bible says, hey, death has no more victory. Death has no more sting for the believer. And so for a Christian, death becomes a passage rather than a pit. It is something we pass through into life. In some very small, poorly, uh, poor, poorly pictured sense, it's kind of like death is like retiring versus being fired. You still don't go back to work the next day, right? But would you rather be fired or would you rather retire? Uh, obviously, we all know the answer to that. Death is the process by which we are delivered into eternity. And Paul goes as far as saying that death is now profitable for the Christian. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And he said, I would love to go and see Christ but the Lord has a plan for me. He has callings for me. He has commands for me. And so I stay in my mortality, longing to put on immortality, groaning for that glorification and that consummation and that completion that God has promised to me. But I will wait and I will serve my king and I will reach out to the lost, hoping to, to be a part of saving souls so that they can join with us in the household of God and in eternity. Sarah was no longer with Abraham, but he knew that she wasn't gone. She was alive, and he would go to her one day. But meanwhile, there was a logistical problem. He had nowhere to place her body. Verse 3, when Abraham got up from beside his dead wife, he spoke to the Hethites, I'm an alien residing among you. Give me burial property among you so that I can bury my dead. On the human level, this would have been another hard day for Abraham, obviously. I'm not trying to be trite, but, but doing funeral arrangements, this kind of thing, is hard enough, and he actually has no right to bury his own wife in this land. He is a stranger there. The people own the land, and so he has to go and ask permission to secure a burial ground for his wife and his family. Uh, he has to deal with her remains. Uh, he has to figure out who he has to meet with. And remember, in the back of his mind, he would not be able to help but, re but think that God had promised that the whole land actually belonged to him. And you know, God had said, this is all yours. And yet he wasn't able to say, okay, this is mine and I'm going to use it. And so even though the whole land had been given to him by Almighty God, he didn't even possess, possess enough of it to dig a grave or put a bone box. 
Uh, so I think this would have been a pretty frustrating experience. I probably would have thrown up my hands and said, man, Lord, what gives? Really, after all of these years, you're not going to like, you know, throw me some beachfront here that I could, you know, say this is mine, my little corner of heaven. And the Lord's like, yeah, no, you don't have a corner of heaven yet because this isn't heaven. This is the earth. And so I, I probably would have been very frustrated with the Lord, but Abraham didn't throw up his hands. In fact, we see his, the resiliency of his faith. We see a strength in his faith in his request to the Hethites. Commentators point out that Abraham made no plan to bring his wife's remains back to his homeland. He still had connections with his old family back in Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, I'm sure they would have allowed him to piggyback into one of their tombs. He says, yeah, I don't want to go back there. Canaan is our home because God says it's our home. And Hebrew scholars point out that when he says burial property there, the word is the possession. And, and I think that just reveals to us a little bit of his heart and his belief, his faith. He says, I would like to have some of my possession, please. And so he still believed that this land belonged to him, just as God had said, and that it was just simply being occupied by Hethites at the moment. Abraham's faith was focused on the future, the future city, the future life, the future fulfillment. That future focus gave him peace in this horrible time in his life. He could navigate this painful situation with patience and meekness, even though he was having to pay for something that already belonged to him. Have you ever had to pay for something that already belongs to you? Have you ever had to, you know, uh, I, was, I had to, a month or so ago, I was down somewhere where I had to rely on using a parking meter, but I was there for like all day, and I just kept like going, and I'm like, ah. I really didn't want to pay for parking that I wasn't going to use. It's kind of the opposite, right? And I, had, I just had to keep go feeding the meter, and I felt like I was being overcharged anyway, and then I was like, I, then a, a, and then a space opened up closer to where I was, but I thought, well, I'm not paying twice for parking. I already paid for parking. And so Abraham has to pay for something that already belonged to him. Verse 5, the Hethites replied to Abraham, listen to us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in our finest burial place. None of us will withhold from you his burial place for burying your dead. Now, this whole scene is very formal and very legal, uh, and, and there's no way for us to know whether these Hethites were good guys or not. Some feel like they were completely taking advantage from a, uh, of Abraham from the beginning. Some think they were truly being generous and that they had affection for him. We don't know. Either way, what they're saying here is, we don't really want to sell any of our land to you. And that is what Abraham is asking for, by the way. He's not just saying, give it to me as a donation. The, the, the terms he's using, he says, hey, I want to buy a certain plot of land from you. And they're just not really into it. They say, but your family's bones can crash in our tombs if you want. It's fine. We've got some, you know, bone space in our weird tombs. And so uh, go ahead and, and use that. If these guys are more on the sleazy side, it's possible they were thinking, hey, this guy is wealthy and powerful, but he's moving around all the time. Sometimes he's down in Philistine country. Sometimes he's here. Sometimes he's there. Maybe we'll let him put a bone box or two in one of our tombs, and then he'll be gone, and who knows what happens to those bone boxes. We'll get rid of it, Right. Maybe they really did like him and, and have a reverence for him and that they were being deferential. But either way, it seems that they didn't really want to part with their land. What is clear is that the presence of God was evident in Abraham's life. When they looked at him, they said, you know what? God is with that family. God is with that man. And that's still what God wants to do in our lives, by the way, as he builds testimonies through our experiences. Verse 7 then Abraham rose and bowed down to the Hethites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you're willing for me to bury my dead, listen to me and ask Ephron, son of Zohar, on, on my behalf, uh, ancestor of Nora Ephron, by the way, to give me the cave of Machpelah, full circle, give me this cave that belongs to him. It is at the field, end of his field. Let him give it to me in your presence for the full price as burial property. We don't barter in our culture. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld was once asked why there's no haggling in our country, and his response was, I guess we like to think we've progressed beyond a knife fight for a citrus drink. <laughs> but in Abraham's time, uh, haggling and bartering was the name of the game. So Abraham knew the spot. He had scouted out this cave. Linguists tell us that uh, it was a primo double cave. I didn't know there were double caves, but this apparently was a double cave. Uh, as far as caves go, that's pretty cool, I guess. 
And now he has to do this strange sort of cultural dance with the owner. But we notice this. Even when it comes to a burial place, Abraham wants to be sure he remains separate. We saw this before when he had to deal with the king of Sodom. He says, hey, listen, I'm not your enemy. You know, I'm not mad at you or anything, but I want to remain separate. He lives this strange life of being in the world, but not of the world. Uh, We see Abraham, he is a blessing to those around him, but he keeps himself devoted to God and separate from what the world is doing. In this transaction, Abraham is gracious, he's patient, he's not demanding. Even though he is fabulously wealthy and has a lot of influence, he behaves meekly and courteously. W.H. Griffith Thomas writes, religion is not intended to decrease, but to increase natural politeness, gentlemanliness, and courtesy. Indeed, courtesy is one of the truest marks of a genuine believer. Verse 10, Ephron was sitting among the Hephites. So in the hearing of all the Hephites who came to the gate of his city, Ephron the Hephite answered Abraham, no, my Lord, listen to me, I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the sight of my people, bury your dead talking a lot about giving, but this is a business transaction. He's not really going to give it to him. This is just all part of the dance. The term used there can also be translated, I'll grant you, I'll grant it to you, I'll grant you this land, or I'll sell you the land. And Ephron knows he's got a decent payday coming because Abraham is very wealthy. He's in a tight spot where he needs to unload his cargo, if uh, not to be too crass about it. Uh, And he's already said, hey, I'll pay full price. Uh, and so Ephron knows he's, he's, got a, he's got a good payday coming. And notice what he does there. He includes the field with the cave. Abraham just wanted the cave. He didn't want the field. But he says, hey, the field and the cave? Yeah, for sure. I'll grant that to you. So he parcels them together uh, and uh, proceeds that way. Verse 12, Abraham bowed down to the people of the land, and he said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, listen to me, if you please. Let me pay the price of the field. Accept it from me. Let me bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham and said to him, My Lord, listen to me. Land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed with Ephron, and Abraham weighed out to Ephron the silver that he agreed to in the hearing of the Hethites, 400 standard shekels of silver. How much money was this? Some people think it was an insane asking price. The truth is we just don't know. Estimates of how much money this was range from a few hundred dollars to over a hundred thousand dollars. We just don't know. You can look at some comparisons in the Bible. In the time of Moses, 400 shekels of silver would be the equivalent of eight healthy adult male slaves. I I don't know if that's a lot or not. I mean, (laughs) but rather than debate the bill, we should examine the behavior of Abraham. In the midst of his heartache, He's strengthened by God to be very patient, full of peace, to endure the stupid frustrations of living in an unfair world. He's humble. He's not handicapped by an obsession with money. We just see Abraham living on a different level. He, he's, he's operating up here. He's thinking about heaven. He's thinking about the resurrection. He's thinking about the future. Whether it was a lot of money or not a lot of money, none of that mattered. None of that mattered because he's like, hey, this is what needs to be done in my life right now, uh, and my life is about more than how much silver I'm paying for this thing. Uh, I I need to honor my, my wife. I need to take care of these things. I want to demonstrate with my life that I believe God. I believe Him that this is my land, and this is where we're gonna be. And so he's just operating at a different level. Verse 17, so Ephron's field at Machpelah near Mamre, the field with its cave and all the trees anywhere within the boundaries of the field became Abraham's possession in the sight of all the Hethites who came to the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field at Machpelah near Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field with its cave passed from the Hethites to Abraham as burial property. Once again, we see the presence of trees in Abraham's story. We had seen him previously living by the oaks. We've seen him plant a tamarisk tree. These trees are symbols reminding us of the long-term abundant work God intended to do in the lives of his people in that real specific land. It's a picture to us of how God establishes and makes us strong and gives us strength to withstand wind and storms. 
These trees demonstrate to us how by God's grace we grow and we expand and we're able to branch out into new areas of fruitfulness. How God develops us to be useful and beautiful and firm, giving help and shade to those nearby. How God faithfully discharges his responsibility to give us light and water that we might become all that he wants us to be. It shows us that even in death, our lives are a declaration of life and our eternal hope, the resurrection, that we are leaving this life, but one day we will be back to receive everything that was promised in full and that God's promise is worth the trouble. It's worth the price. It's worth the patient endurance of our mortal lives. It's worth the cultivation. It's, it's worth all that we have to offer to the Lord. The suffering of this present time is not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Like the creation all around, we Christians eagerly wait with anticipation for God's sons and daughters to be revealed in immortal perfection, redeemed into glorious freedom, receiving all that God has promised, with not one good thing missing from the inheritance He's decided to share with us. After all God had promised to Abraham, it looked like he had one kid and one death cave. That's all it looked like he had. How could Abraham square this with his actual, you know, experience and, and the actual promises of God? And it's not that he didn't care. Remember, God had earlier made those promises, and Abraham had said, okay, how can I know that I will possess it? And God's assurance to him at that time was simply, I am God, and I promise. And that was enough for Abraham. And from that moment, Abraham's faith started growing, not because he started getting more and more deeds to land like Monopoly where you start buying up property. He, it's not, that's not why he grew closer to the Lord and believed more in the Lord, but because he knew more of God as he walked with God. The closer he got with the Lord, the more Abraham was able to understand the extent of really what God was promising. How did he know about the resurrection? How did he know about the future heavenly city? We don't know, but it's because he was close to God. He didn't have revelation in the sense that we do. He didn't have the 66 books of the Bible. He had zero books of the Bible. And yet he knew about the resurrection and he knew about heaven. And we have to come to the conclusion that the way he knew about those things is because he drew close to God and God was close to him. And he came to the realization that he didn't want to be the Hethites now owning some land. He wanted to be God's child in eternity. And so he was content to wait, to live as a pilgrim in a tent because he knew God's ultimate fulfillment was on the other side of death, not only on the other side. After all, the Jews did receive that very land. It's still theirs, and God will still have a physical kingdom with a throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And already God has made good on his promise to give Abraham countless descendants, real descendants. What was a mom, a dad, and a kid Today is 6.9 million Jews living in Israel, another 6 million in the USA, another million more living around the world. And that doesn't even count the spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham, which include you and I, for thousands of years of history. And so Abraham had real fulfillment in this side of eternity, but he also knew that the best was yet to come. And he says, that's, that's the fulfillment I want. That's the fulfillment I'm looking for. That's the one I care about. In Hebrews, we're told Abraham did not receive what was promised in his mortal life. I quoted it earlier, but here's what we find when we read both verse 39 and 40 of that passage. All these, like Abraham, were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Abraham knew the promise was perfect and that it wasn't just for a dusty field or two in the year 2000 BC. It was something greater, something eternal, something this life cannot match. When the days were hard, when he was dealing with death and seeing unbelievers around him seemingly prosper in ways that would be nice to prosper in, Abraham didn't despair. In fact, we see him more devoted than ever to the truth God had told him, that the promise is coming, that what we really want is not found in this world, but it is found in the next world and that we can secure our lives on the hope which will not disappoint us because God has proved his power. He has proved his love for us. He has proved that death has been beaten. He has proved that we will be delivered into glory. We have received 
these and many more promises from this very same God, and they will be kept in full. Not 50%, not 67%, all of them, all the way, beyond what we can ever ask or imagine, our God will not fail, and He is with us forever. Thank you.